So I want to talk about three big ideas. One is the concept of very complex formulas. Uh, the second is the notion that you have to really look at patterns that are long-term uh, and ask yourself about almost like geometry, and I'll come back to that. And then the third is the power of culture and society as compared to government and bureaucracy. And I want to talk about all three. But let me start with the first. One of the reasons that Nancy and I created the center in the first place is that health is so enormous to stand up to cancer, which is a terrific project, and which builds on a almost 40-year-old announcement by Richard Nixon that we should declare war on cancer, and it builds on an enormous cumulative investment at National Institutes of Health, and a parallel smaller investment at the National Science Foundation, and the work of dozens of foundations around the United States and around the world, all of which have, have now spent all this time learning more and more about the human genome, about all sorts of things. And, and I mentioned the National Science Foundation because a lot of what we now do is a function of math and a function of chemistry and physics, which uh, provide tools that biology then uses for research. So all these things are going on simultaneously. Then you get to a breakthrough. But the breakthrough, unless it can be commercialized, doesn't actually exist, even though we know it's there, because there's no way to deliver it to lots of people. Then you encounter the Food and Drug Administration, which has become a major problem for getting things from the laboratory to you. Then you encounter the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services, which has become the leading standard for paying things, and which might decide not to pay for something even if the Food and Drug Administration approves it. Then you get to all the doctors who've already been educated, who may not understand the very new therapy or the new drug, or may not believe in it. And so unless they decide they're going to voluntarily acquire this new pattern, it won't exist for you as a patient because your doctor won't tell you about it. And then we have you. Because if we have a brand new way of detecting cancer and you refuse to get a blood test, and this is, we've been through this now with mammograms, we've been through with colonoscopies, and Katie Couric spent a large part of her career after her husband died trying to drive people to voluntarily... Because, you know, I mean, think about it. Even if you believe in a national health system, you cannot have coercive colonoscopies. <laughs> I mean, there's, just, there's a limit to what you can impose on people. <laughs> so, so the first purpose of having a Center for Health Transformation is to bring together innovative, smart people and innovative, smart institutions and to try to cover the gamut of the entire formula within which health is obtained. I recently came ran across a Lincoln quote. Lincoln said, uh, if a man continues to insist that 2 plus 2 equals anything but 4, you cannot win the argument because facts don't matter. I want to start with this idea that the, the great if I were in your shoes, the great, and I wasn't thinking about how to make a profit this quarter or whatever you're, whatever you're doing institutionally in the short run. When you look at the long run patterns, we are clearly going to have very dramatic reformulations of how we're doing business as a country. In almost every sector of American life, we are now too expensive, too bureaucratic, too litigious, and too cumbersome. We're evolving too slowly. And so the result's going to be just this unending pressure for continuous reformulation. I mean, you're seeing it in Madison, Wisconsin. You're seeing it in Columbus, Ohio. I was just in, in Des Moines, Iowa yesterday where they're going through it. At the state level where they actually have to have balanced budgets, the pressure to change is excruciating. At the city and county level, the pressure is excruciating. And it's going to be excruciating in health. The second thing I want you to think about is there's a new book out on Lincoln and geometry, which points out that Lincoln studied Euclid's geometry in the 1850s, and that he applies it, that his speech is starting with the Lincoln-Douglas debates up through his, the second inaugural at the end of his life. There's an underlying geometric effort to say, these are facts, and these facts lead you to this conclusion. At the center, we get into that at two levels. One is we decided we were individually centered not patient-centered, because we want to catch people before they become patients. And we want them to be healthy enough to postpone patient status. And we concluded our interest was in health rather than health care, that health care is a subset of health policy, and therefore we're interested in a much larger, broader conversation than health care. Think about what we're with health. The, the number one crises in America are obesity, lack of exercise, and unwillingness to talk directly about what it takes. 
And then we all say, gee, this is a really hard problem. It wasn't in 1961, the great crisis was food stamps because we had malnutrition. In 2011, the great crisis is overnutrition. And in 50 years, we solved the first problem, but as, as good humans, uh, our natural basis is not homeostasis. We do not figure out a natural balance. So we've gone from too little food to too much food. We've gone from being worked into the ground in steel mills and plowing behind a mule to laying on a couch trying to figure out how to move the, the, the TV channel without effort. You know, I mean, the next great thing will be if you can just think the channel and you won't even have to use, you won't even have to use your fingers. Now, these are cultural phenomena, and they require rethinking culturally what we do. And they require setting up payment mechanisms that are the opposite of the last 50 years. For the last 50 years, we've had a victim orientation that basically said, you know, if you were dramatically overweight, the, the term fat now being politically incorrect, uh, but if you are, you are if you're dramatically overweight uh, and, and smoke and drink two quarts of hard liquor a day and have not moved off your couch in three years, we feel really bad for you and we need to subsidize you. And so we subsidize you at eating more, drinking more, and doing less. And then we wonder that we have a problem. Now, in fact, historically, what you do is just the opposite. The companies we work with who have very successful in internal insurance programs reward the people who are healthy, reward the people who get an annual physical, reward the people who actually solve their problems. You're going to see tremendous pressure to create um, a movement to, re to reinforce the Tenth Amendment. The Tenth Amendment basically says, in, in the Bill of Rights, uh, it basically says all powers not expressly given to the government, to the federal government, are reserved to the states and the people thereof. I always remind governors. It doesn't say take power from Washington and send it to the governor's office. It says take the power from Washington and put it back in the people of Arizona, the people of California, the people of Georgia. And then they can decide which do they want to keep personally? Which do they want their family to engage in? Which do they want their voluntary organizations to solve? Which do they want to have solved by their local community? Which should be solved by the state government? And then, by the way, they may send some stuff back to Washington after they think about it. If you think about that model and you compare where we are today, that model implies that you personally are going to be challenged to be a lot bigger citizen. But if you're going to have a smaller government, you're going to have bigger citizens. And that means you're going to have to think about what's the culture you want to live in. What is it you want to set as the norms?